morning, everyone. Good morning. It's great to be in the house of God on Sabbath, isn't it? Yes. I want to say just briefly how much I appreciate all of you being here today. And also, it's very evident that you love the Lord because the way our church looks indicates to us and to our community what we think about our God. It looks very nice here. I'm just glad to be a part of it. And we are involved with young people and so on. And I understand from Bob and some of you others that there have been a number of churches that have been spawned off from this one, and that's wonderful too. I do want to tell you a couple of just really brief things. One is that Kathy and I are involved in a little spawn church that's just been spun off of the Knoxville, Tennessee First Church. It's called the North Knoxville Church. We have 25 members, and uh, it's growing. We have a lot of pre Adventists coming to our church right now, which is interesting to us. We're giving Bible studies to people who will have a baptism on the 21st of December. But the thing that I'm going to tell you is, because we are interested in Bible study, for the last several weeks, we've had 80% of our church at prayer meeting, wow. which is pretty amazing. Less, it's, really, it's only 20 people, but that's still 80%. And we're very happy about that. Let me tell you something interesting also. We understand that we're near the end of time. We all know that. We're living in the end of time. We're studying this quarter of our Sabbath school lessons that we're in the great uh, pre epic judgment time. Uh, and the signs are all about us. Amazing signs that God has given us. But the, the real interesting part to me is that the gospel, listen carefully, is presently going to all the world. I've been traveling all over the world for the last 20 years working at the General Conference, and I've never been a place where they haven't said to me, including the highlands of New Guinea, I have seen you on 3ABN or the Hope Channel or something like that. This is just really, really awesome. And since our kind of retirement and moving from General Conference down to Tennessee, Kathy and I are working half time with Adventist World Radio. So I just want to tell you one thing about that, and that is our flagship st ship station on Guam in the Central Pacific is now broadcasting in 34 languages. One of them is the Chinese language that reaches everybody in the country of China, which is with the Adventist message. This is incredible. All of India, all of Nepal, all of Tibet, all of Vietnam. It's just incredible. And there are other stations around the world as well. So virtually the whole world is covered. But in 2010, I want to just tell you this one story. 2010, the General Conference, Adventist World Radio, decided to put Adventist World Radio on the internet. So they, they captured, they actually contract with a company named Mediator to digitally capture all the 30 minute programs that go up on the air. And so you can now log on to the internet, awr.org, and it will say, which language do you prefer? And you can download one of 80 languages to hear the Adventist message on the internet. So you can download it to your cell phone, your iPad, your iPod, and listen to it. And since 2010, there have been over 250 million people who have downloaded the Adventist message off the internet. This is just incredible. There's more than 2 million people that have subscriptions and they say anytime you make a program in our language, just automatically send it to us. Now here's the neat part. Guess what language is the most downloaded language of all? Spanish. The answer is Arabic. A number of you knew that. And the real amazing thing is there's 24 Islamic republics. And by the way, if you are a member of Islam, you don't just read the Bible in the King James Version, you understand. You have to learn Arabic to read it. It's, it's mandatory. So all these people speak Arabic. Believe it or not, we cannot have a church service in those areas, and we cannot preach the gospel or have uh, evangelistic meetings publicly. Now, this is the amazing thing. This means that people in those Islamic republics are down under the Adventist message. This, to me, is incredible. And I can tell you angel stories and all kinds of things, but uh, we want to get into our program today. Now, I just this past week was involved in a religious liberty case in the federal district court in Knoxville, Tennessee. And I can tell you that we have an open statement. We present the evidence and that kind of thing. We have closing statements. So as an attorney, I'm going to give you the opening statement of our sermon right now. Please understand that all of Jesus' public meetings that we have recorded, Jesus was seated during that time, and it's like a seminar. So it's not a bad idea to have a sermon. You can check it out, Matthew, the fifth chapter, when he starts the, the uh, Sermon on the Mount. When he starts to talking to his disciples, he's seated. I'm not going to sit down today, but I will just tell you, 
it is not inappropriate to have a sermon on se uh, seminar on Sabbath. Does everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. Most of Jesus' major discourses were while he was seated in And the Bible even says he taught them. Amen. So what we're going to do here, here's the opening statement. Every person who is alive to see the second coming of Christ and is translated, who leaves this earth alive, will have gone through a period of time on this earth when you cannot buy or sell. <laughs> and that is kind of interesting to think about. What I'm going to do this morning is to prepare you for that time. Would you like that information? Amen. It's good information. So we're going to look at it and just see how valuable it is to us. So the Lord does not need our offerings. We cannot enrich Him by our gifts. We're told, Council on Stewardship, page 18. Our Heavenly Father did not originate the plan of systematic benevolence to enrich himself. Please understand, God does not need the money. Are we all tuned into that? Okay. But to be a blessing to man, he saw this system of benevolence was just what man needed. And the reason I'm using PowerPoint, part of it is so that you can get the references and jot them down. We're going to go into the book in just a few minutes so you can see the workbook, and I'll show you where that is. First of all, we're going to look at some hard questions. How could the Bible's author, which we believe Jesus was the one who inspired them through the Holy Spirit, and the editor justify devoting twice as many verses to money than to faith and prayer combined? How could Jesus say more about money than both heaven and hell? Didn't he know what was really important? And the large volume of scripture on the teaching of the subject of money demands our attention. Why does God give us all this instruction on money and possessions? And I ask, what's the point? With so much to be said, and so little time to say it, this is kind of interesting to me. I've had a ministry of over 40 years for the church. How long was Jesus' ministry? Three and a half years. So it was just condensed it all down into three and a half years. So much to say. How could he say all this? And how, so much he could tell us that we really needed to know. Why did the Savior of the world spend the full 15% of his recorded words on this one subject? I believe we have the answer. That's the point that we want to make at today. Why did he say more about how we're to view and handle money and possession than about any other single thing? And the enigma deepens when we look at how closely Jesus linked money to salvation. So the story this morning is not about Zacchaeus. It is only an illustration. We're going to go through it very quickly. What do we know about Zacchaeus? He was the chief tax collector. He was very rich. He was a short man. And he wanted to see Jesus. Does everybody understand that part? Now here's the interesting thing about it. There was one time early in Jesus' ministry when he encountered a leper on the side of the road. He says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. If you touch me, I can be clean. Well, immediately the disciples gathered around Jesus and said, don't touch that guy. If word gets back to the Pharisees that you've touched a leper, your ministry is going to be history. But Jesus did. He walked right over and he touched that and he was healed instantly. There was another experience when somebody said about Jesus, if I could just touch his clothes, I could be healed. You remember, she did and she was. What did Zacchaeus want? He just want to see him. So he's a tax collector. Believe it or not, I want you to understand what a tax collector is like. He works for the IRS, okay? Now this is pretty interesting. So he's either a CPA or an attorney, dressed in a business suit, and he's realizing that Jesus is coming to visit Jericho, the town where he lives now. My idea is that he probably put a little sign in the door with a clock on the back at 2 o'clock. So he runs down to the main street where Jesus will be passing through. Remember, please understand, there was no building large enough to take Jesus' crowds when he was on the earth. Does everybody understand that? It's an amazing thing to understand. So he's going to pass through Jericho. When Zacchaeus gets over there, there's people like 10 deep. It's kind of like Pasadena Boulevard or Colorado Boulevard in Pasadena, California on the Rose Parade Day. People camp out there be able to see. So Zacchaeus comes up and he's in his suit and he says please give way, I'm a short man. What do you think they said? You should have planned ahead. No problem. What does he do? He runs ahead and climbs a tree. Now please understand this isn't a little boy with tennis shoes and shorts on. It's a grown man with his suit on up a tree. Why was he up the tree? He just wanted to see Jesus. Isn't that incredible? Now listen, I want you to understand there's a major point here. When you want to see Jesus, he wants to see you too. And so Jesus directed the crowd right underneath Zacchaeus' tree. And he looked up in the tree, 
and he called him by name, though they had never met. Do you believe he knows your name? He does. And he said, Zacchaeus, come down. And what he said next is amazing. I would never do it myself. He invited himself home for lunch. I'm going to your place for lunch today. Uh, let me just tell you something interesting. My wife is a very good cook. She, she, she makes awesome stuff from scratch. Do you understand what that means? Not just mixing some water with it and frying it or whatever. She can make it. Well, the interesting part about it, Kathy is a good cook, but she does not like surprises. Do you understand what I mean by that? In other words, I don't just bring a whole bunch of people home for lunch. She likes to know it. We frequently entertain people in our house, but when we do, Kathy has actually a written menu. She has all the stuff prepared. Sometimes she even sets the table before we go to church, so when we come home, it's all ready. Some of you have done that before. So Zach is, says, Jesus is coming to his house. I think his whole life passed before him. Because when you get Jesus for lunch, you get 12 hungry men who don't eat regular meals, and they're all coming to your place for lunch. 13 guys. Grow them in. Big appetites. But not to worry, he's a rich man. So he sends someone ahead. We're having lunch with a bunch of guests. Now here's the experience. What do we know about Jesus? Well, I'll put this down. When he saw Zacchaeus, he called him. Oh, he named though they'd never met him by himself. The result of this one encounter with Jesus, Zacchaeus hurried down, joyfully received Jesus. Other people criticized Jesus for eating with this sinner. But Zacchaeus' attitude toward money changed in that one encounter with Jesus, which is amazing. He says, if there's anything I haven't restored, I'm going to give it back four times, and half of the money that I have left, I will give it to the poor. What was Jesus' response to that? He didn't say, that would be a wonderful idea. What he said was, today salvation has come to this house. Would you like Jesus to say that at your place? Yeah. Today salvation has come to this house. So Jesus judged the reality of this man's salvation based on his willingness, his cheerful eagerness to part with his money for the glory of God and the good of others. So the Bible tells us, we're really getting into the meat of the presentation now, what the last and most trying temptation of Satan will be and how to prepare for it. Here is the great and last uh, trial of God's faith that we will encounter. It's Revelation 13, 17, that no man may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast. You avoid the mark of the beast, you can't buy or sell. Pretty simple. Not being able to provide for yourself and your family will be on faith almost worse than that. Now I'm going to tell you something. You guys probably know that there's this expression about a plumber has leaky faucets. You've heard that. I practice what I preach. So I've paid off my debts and all of those kinds of things. And I can tell you, we're going to talk about retirement this afternoon, a little bit about that, and a lot of other interesting things, how to pay off your house and so on. How and when to get a student loan. By the way, I'm against debt, but I think in certain circumstances it's a good idea to get a student loan. I'll tell you how to do it this afternoon. But at any rate, here's the story. There's three prerequisites to retirement. The first one is to be totally debt-free, including your home mortgage. The second one is to have a reasonable income stream. And the third one is to have health insurance. So I've done all those things. But at some time, I will not be able to buy or sell. Does that make sense? Do you understand? I'm going to have to face it, even though I have all my ducks in a row. So what I'm going to tell you is something interesting. Someone could kill you. But what if you could live on and on and not be able to buy or sell? How can a person or family prepare for this time? And the answer is very simple, by eliminating the three most significant elements that we can faith with God. And here they are. So this is the outline of the presentation today. The three greatest hindrances to financial faithfulness. You guys are going to get tired of me talking about debt. But if I have a man, this young man should play the guitar nicely this morning. I, I actually would like to play the guitar. But it takes a lot of skill and a lot of practice to be able to do that. So I just have a guitar with one string. Whenever I play it, it says, get out of debt. Get out of debt. One string. Okay. So here it is, the debt bondage. If I am in debt when I can't buy or sell, what can I do to protect my home, my car, my other assets, and my own good name? Proverbs 22, verse 7, we've already talked about it in the Sabbath school time. The rich rule of the poor and the borrower is the slave of the lender. So I just recently read this book, written by a Seventh-day Adventist man, Scott Christensen. The book is called Planet in Distress. Scott is a very interesting person. He's worked in the worldwide community. For eight years, he served for Advent in China and Nepal. 
very, very interesting guy. He is now working at the Southern New England Conference, but he wrote this book, Planet of Distress, Distress, and he discusses the decay of our global food system, the, the decay of our global climate, the decay of our oceans, and there's whole chapters on this. Are you guys aware that there are certain segments of the oceans where it is totally dead, and nothing lives there? This is just a new phenomenon near the end of time. The decay of our fresh water systems, most of you know that of all the water on the earth, only 3% is potable water, which means that it's okay to drink. Fresh water. And we're polluting that part. Very interesting. The decay of our financial system and other problems with all the things that we depend on for survival. And Scott ties all these concerns into the great controversy and then gives two chapters on how to prepare for the serious things that are coming. And he begins by saying, Eliminate debt. And here's his reason. When we're in debt to the world, we are beholden to the world. We must remain engaged in the world in order to maintain our debt payments, in order to freely serve the Lord whenever and wherever he calls. We urgently need to eliminate debt. So if we're serious about being faithful to God at the end and being among those who will stick with him and be protected from the plagues and be part of the group that is translated to heaven, then it would be wise for us to make a plan to get out of debt ASAP, which everybody knows means, as soon as possible. Okay, we're going to look at the second one. Actually, the third one is the, is the most significant one probably you've never heard before, but we're going to look at this one too. Treasure stored up on earth. When the rich young man, the rich young ruler we call him, asked Jesus what he must do to gain eternal life, Jesus first said to him, keep the commandments. He says, which ones? So Jesus started quoting some of the Ten Commandments. He said, well, you can stop right now because I've been doing that since I was a little kid. Was he sincere and was he serious? Yes, he had been doing that. Jesus said, well, now what do I lack yet? He says, go sell what you have given you for. You'll have treasure in heaven. Then you come and follow me. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell the story. Every one of them says, you'll have treasure stored in heaven. And he was called personally. And this is very, very interesting to me to see this happen as it did. By the way, all of them say the young man went away sorrowful because what? He had great possessions. So I want you to understand something. I teach on eschatology, and I believe in something very amazing, and that is that there's a great prophetic timeline, and we're at the end of it. Let's just say that from the corner way over there to the corner way over here is all of time. So way over there is that creation. So what would be on the other side of creation? That's eternity past where God there. You know, in the beginning, God, he's already there. And then outside the other door over here, that's eternity future. You know, after the second coming of Christ. So with all of time and all of eternity, how much of a space is your life? It's like a dot. Yes. Dot com. Just a period. Do you understand, everybody? That's how long your life is. The rich young ruler, oh, by the way, from that dot, the line stretches out that has no end that goes on for eternity, forever and ever and ever. If you're smart, would you concentrate more on the dot or the line? Do you understand how significant it is? The rich young ruler went away sorrowful because he had great possession. He knew it right then. I have traded all of eternity for here and now. That was stupid. You don't hear that word from the pulpit very often, but it is true. Absolutely true. And he knew it. That's the interesting part. So we're going to go on now. Why did Jesus tell him that? The heavenly treasure was assured him if he would follow Christ. The very holiness of God was offered to the young ruler. This is Desire of Ages 5.19. Christ was drawn to the young man. He knew him to be sincere in his association. He even called him to be one of his disciples. But Christ made the only terms which could place the ruler where he could perfect the Christian character. His words were words of wisdom. Though they appeared to be severe and exacting, and accepting and obeying them was the ruler's only hope of salvation. Because he knew that this young man's God was his money. He doesn't ask us all to sell everything to give to the poor. Do you understand that? Or to become itinerant missionaries and drop everything and go on and follow Jesus like that. But would you like him to tell you that if that was your only means of salvation? Yes. yes. And that's what he did to the young man. We won't spend a lot of time on this, but I will tell you this. In the last chapter of the book Faith and Finance, it's called The Rewards of Faithfulness, and there's probably only a few people in this room that understand what I'm going to tell you next, and that is what we store up treasures in heaven is not for God's benefit, it's for our own benefit, which I told you last night. Very, very interesting. We see in the Zara of Ages, when Christ's followers give back to the Lord his own, 
they, Christ's followers, are accumulating treasure which will be given to them when they shall hear the words, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. So we went through this earlier, so I'm not going to spend time on it now. So we're going to look at Satan's plan for your money. This, to me, is very, very interesting. Selfishness and materialism plays a major part in the great controversy. Now, I have an opportunity. I can just tell you that uh, the first week or two of January, I'm going to be speaking to the pastors, all the pastors in the conference out of Texaco, which is part of Texas and all of Mexico. So I go to workers' meetings a lot. And I can just tell you, do you think the devil has workers' meetings if God has workers' meetings? <laughs> sure he does. So Ellen White was once given a vision of one of the devil's workers' meetings. Mm. So I'm going to show it to you. It's recorded in Testimonies to Ministers, page 473, 474. It's in quotations in the spirit of prophecy because Ellen White heard the devil say that. Go make the possessors of lands and money drunk with the cares of this life. Present the world before them in its most attractive life that they may lay up their treasure here and fix their affections upon earthly things. Do you think the devil has been successful with this so far? Yes. This is pretty amazing. We must do our utmost to prevent those who labor in God's cause from obtaining means to use against us. Keep the money in our own ranks. The more means they obtain, the more they will injure our kingdom by taking from us our subjects, make them care more for money than for the upbuilding of Christ's kingdom, and the spread of the truth we hate, and we need not fear their influence. Remember, Ellen White never underlines anything, but I underline a lot, so notice what I underline. For we know that, this is the devil speaking now, we know that every selfish, covetous person will fall under our power and will find that he's separated from God's people. Now this is pretty interesting. So we're going to look at the significance of timing. I want you guys to jot these down. It's in your book on one of the pages there. We're in the fourth session, and I'll see if I can see exactly where it is so you can find it. Now, I know that since you have these, that you want to look at it. Yes, it's on page 10. Page 10 of this. You must understand that Malachi 3.10 is not the primary tithe text in the Bible. The primary tithe text, Malachi 3 was given in a kind of great apostasy. God's calling his people back to faith. Do you remember that? It's a good text, but the title legislation is actually given in Leviticus 27.30, where it says, all the tithe of the land of the Lord, it is holy unto the Lord. Now here's something amazing. What could God do with his tithe if he wanted to? The answer is in the question. Anything he wanted to, would that be a good answer? If it's God's tithe, it's holy, it belongs to him. Could God take the tithe back to heaven if he wanted to? So we've been studying the sanctuary in our Sabbath school lessons, and I was a teacher the last two weeks, so I appreciate the teachers cutting it short a little bit today for our seminar. But I will just tell you that if I sin, I would take what kind of a land for the sanctuary? One without blemish. And then I cut its throat. This is very interesting. The priest would catch some of the blood. You understand that experience. But the amazing thing is, what happened to most of the land after the blood was taken out? It was burned up. So could God take our tithe and burn it up if he wanted to? He doesn't need the money, does he? He could burn it up. But what did he decide to do with his tithe? That's Numbers 18.21. Let's everybody look at it. Grab your Bibles and go there. I'm going to, in mind, because I want you to see that I didn't just make this up. This is Numbers 18.21. God says, Behold, I have given the children of Levi, or the ministers, all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance, in return for the work which they performed, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. So God says, I'm not going to burn it up. I'm not going to take it to heaven. I'm going to pay the pastor with it. So that's why the Adventist church does that. Pretty simple. Now I'm going to tell you, I put another reference down there, and this is only for you to look up. Ninth Testimony, 245 to 252. Much of the writings of Ellen White that you can get, like Adventist Home, Council on Diet and Foods, many, many messages young people, they're what we call compilations. And it's just like some guy like me or somebody like you would say, would you please write a book about angels? And there's one like that. You can get all about angels. And so I look at this in the index and look at all the texts and references on angels and I write this book. But wouldn't it be better if you had something on tithing instead of a compilation?
just exactly what Ellen White said on time. Well, you have it here, the faithful stewardship, 245 to 252. Listen carefully. Every question you've ever had about time is answered here. For example, I know some real good independent ministries that do a wonderful work. Wouldn't it be okay for me to send my tithe to them? Ask Ellen White. In Stuart County, this 9th Testimony 245 and 252, she says, these should be supported, but not from the tithe. In those exact words. Is that plain enough? Plain for me. Well, let's go on. We're going to look at it. The final one here is financial unfaithfulness to God. This is one of the hindrances to being ready to the time we can't by ourselves. So we're going to look at it and see it. Now, you see number two here, the tithing is the hedge against selfishness. That's what I found. And I've been teaching stewardship for many years, and it's just gone in the last couple of years how important Deuteronomy 1423 is. So we're going to look at it, you'll see it. Here it is. God established a tithing system to protect us from selfishness and to encourage us to trust Him. So here, look at this. Deuteronomy 14, 22 and 23. You shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain and the field produced year by year. Why? That you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. Now what does fear mean in this case? Well, you know when you read through the Psalms, they have this poetic parallelism that says the same thing in two different ways. Here's one of them. Oh, how great is your goodness for which you have laid up for those who fear you, which you have prepared for those who do what? Trust in you. So the fear of the Lord is trust in him. So when you look at Psalm 31, 19, and Deuteronomy 14, 22, and 23, you understand that every time we tithe, it builds up our trust in God. So this is important. I just want you to see that fact. So here's a little story. And this one is very interesting. And I actually found a picture of this. And I'll show it to you in just a second. Ellen White had something like 2,000 visions and dreams. Only one of all that she had that she ever said, I'm never going to forget any detail of this as long as I live. And this one she called it an impressive dream. She had it while Adam Creek in August of 1868. I dreamed of being with a large body of company, body of people. A portion of this assembly started out prepared to journey, and we traveled, had heavily loaded wagons. As we journeyed, the road seemed to ascend. On one side of the road was a deep precipice. On the other side was a high, smooth white wall, like the hard finish of unplastered rooms. How many of you have ever read this before? It's in volume two of the Testimonies, 594. Many of you have heard it. That's very, very interesting. I'm just going to tell you the story in one minute. Here it is. As they're going with wagons, with horses hooked up to wagons, the trail got so steep and so narrow that they couldn't go with the team of horses. What did they do with the horses? They disconnected them from the wagon, left the wagon behind. They put the horses single file and started riding the horses. And then it got so narrow and so steep they couldn't do that anymore. They were bumping their knees on the rocks. So they left the horses behind and started off single file by foot. And then it got to this so narrow and so steep they couldn't carry stuff. They dropped everything off. Notice now, I found a picture of that. There it is. This is actually not it. It is a walk you can take in China. Why wouldn't it be it? Because it has a wooden platform for you to walk on instead of a little narrow rock ledge. And what else does it have where you can hold on? Chain. You see that? Now listen carefully to what I'm going to tell you. In the dream, Ellen White said that a little cord was dropped down beside of each person for balance. Did you get the word balance? It's not to hold all your weight, it's just to kind of guide you. I'll give you an illustration. Some of you guys have been to Pathfinders before or worked for Pathfinders. If you go to a rushing mountain stream and there's a log across it, and you want to take the Pathfinders to the other side, I'll bet half of them are going to fall in. Some of them on purpose. <laughs> is this true? <laughs> oh, I slipped. Um, the bottom line is, you can stretch a skinny little rope across it just for balance, and they can walk across holding one hand on that. Most of them will make it. Isn't that true? So he says, this little cord, she says, this little cord was let down. But as they traveled, it got steeper and steeper, and the cord got bigger and bigger and bigger. Until, well, I'll show you what happened. This is pretty interesting. Kathy and I, when we lived in Maryland, had these two huge poplar trees right over our house in the backyard. So we hired a company to come and remove these trees. And what they did is they had a man that went up, and he was lifted up there by a big crane, and he would hook parts onto it, and then he would come down on the rope, as you see in the picture here, and he's swinging around his whole weight on this rope. Now, you guys don't understand this about me, but when I was 
younger growing up. My father was in the logging business, and I learned to use chainsaws and so on. So when I was at the seminary, another logging guy and I put together a tree trimming business. So we would go and trim trees in old people's houses and let them down by ropes and so on. But we didn't have these fancy equipment with a bucket truck and all of that. We just had to throw our belt around, hook it on, and climb up with our spurs, you know, that kind of thing. Well, at any rate, we would swing around. I knew that a half inch rope would hold up my body. But you can't work when you're scared. So I would always use five eighths or three quarters just to be sure. You understand? Because you can't just trust it if you don't really trust it. So what I'm going to tell you is this is pretty interesting now. The devil's last, last temptation, financial embargo. Has God made provision for this time? The answer is yes, by teaching us to trust him with our daily lives. He established the tithe. So notice this statement. In the last great conflict with, in the controversy with Satan, those who are loyal to God will see every earthly support cut off. Hmm. Anybody would have a clue what that means? Yesterday, after driving over here from Knoxville, we filled up our car with gas. Guess how I did it? With my credit card. And it says, you know, put it in here. Sometimes it says you put it in your area code where you live and so on. And so you do that. And then it says approve, you know, lift up the thing and push the button the one you want. What if my card was not approved? You understand what every earthly support is? That means your power is cut off, your cell phone business is cut off, everything is cut off. You can't use your credit card. Nobody can take cash from you. You can't sell them stuff. Pretty serious. Everybody has a perfect support that we cut off. Those, uh, well, because they refuse to break this law and beat us to earthly powers, they will be forbidden to buy or sell. Now, this, Ellen White noticed the devil talking again. Satan says, for fear of wanting food and clothing, they will join with the world in transgressing of God's law. The earth will be wholly under my dominion. That's what Satan says. So, when you get to this point, when you cannot buy or sell, what size rope would you like to have? Now remember, in the story that Ellen White saw the dream, when they got to this point, the rope was as big as their body. Now you could hold on to a half-inch rope or a three-quarter, even a one-inch rope, probably with one hand. But if it's a great big rope, what does it take? Both hands. So what else can you hold on to? Nothing. Now listen carefully. Every time we're faithful to God with our money, our rope gets bigger. So when that time comes, if you've been faithful, you can tell the devil, take a hike. I trust that God will take care of you. Amen. Do you understand? Amen. But what if I've been one of those kind of persons that's always said, well, the church doesn't need my money, and the conference does stuff with the money that I don't believe in, and God, besides God knows how poor I am, and you haven't developed your strong rope. What will happen at that time? There's not a person alive that would swing across the Grand Canyon on a clothesline rope. Not even a daredevil. Do you understand what I'm saying? And that's why thousands, did you hear the word I just said? Thousands of so uh, apparently faithful members will leave the church immediately because they don't trust God. You must develop your faith in God. That's what this is all about. And doing that strengthens the road. We'll go on. God's plan in this tithing system is beautiful in its simplicity and quality. Great objects are accomplished by this system. One of them is prepared for that time. The treasury will be full if adopted all adopted the system, and the contributors will not be left the poorer. Through every investment made, they will become more wedded to the cause of truth, or your, your rope is getting bigger and bigger. Whenever God's people in any period of the world have cheerfully and willingly carried out his plan of systematic benevolence, that is tithe, and in gifts and offerings, they have realized the standing promise that prosperity should attend all their labors just in proportion as they've obeyed his requirements. When they acknowledge the claims of God and comply with the requirements, honoring Him with our substance, their barns were filled with plenty. And that's Third Testimonies 395. Now I'm going to show you a couple of things that are pretty interesting. Ellen White equates, and many others do, not just Adventist people, tithing and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So I'm going to show it to you. The tithing system is the equivalent to the last day of Christian of the tree of knowledge of good and evil for having eaten the garden of Eden. So you understand, Council on Sturgeon, page 65, says this. When God placed Adam and Eve in the garden, he says, of all the trees that you see, you may, what's the next two words? Freely eat. I'm only asking you not to eat of this one tree. That's the end. And then Ellen White says, in the same manner, God has placed us in the abundance of this world and says, this is for you. Enjoy. 
I'm only asking them to be faithful to the entire field. That's all. Pretty simple. So I'm going to tell you something interesting. When Kathy and I moved to Loma Linda back in 1972 to go to the School of Health, one of the first things I learned in community nutrition class is not a good health habit to eat between meals. Does everybody know that part? People who eat between meals have more problems with obesity, more dental caries, more hypertension, more diabetes, etc. It's just not a good idea to eat between meals. So you have regular meals and you don't eat that time. So I thought when Eve ate of the fruit, she would probably eat between meals, and that caused a problem for the whole world. <laughs> not true. Notice what I said in the book Education. Remember, Ellen White does not underline the bold. I just put little parentheses here. Everything else is word for word. There was nothing poisonous in the fruit itself. And the sin was not merely yielding to appetite. You understand? That's not eating between meals. It was three things, though. Distrust of God's goodness, disbelief of this word, and rejection of his authority that made our first parents transgress as a body of the world a knowledge of evil. So when we're faithful with our tithes, we show God that we trust his goodness, we believe his word, and we accept his authority. It's pretty simple. Now, we talked about the covenant. He who made his, gave his only begotten son to die for you has made a covenant with you. What is a covenant? It's a promise or an agreement. He gives you his blessings and in return requires you to bring him your tithes and offerings. So I want to talk to you about this one. Failure to tithe according to God is robbery. Now, I, only an attorney can tell you this because most of you probably just know it casually. But in the when you take criminal law in the, in the Theft crimes, it's graduated. It's like theft and burglary and robbery. Do you understand that? For example, if you left something valuable in your yard when you came to church and came back and it was gone, if the person was apprehended that took it, let's just say your lawnmower or your bicycle or whatever, what could they be charged with? Simple theft. Theft by conversion, taking the property of another with no intention of returning it. That's pretty serious, but that's the lowest of the theft crimes. What if you were actually gone and someone broke into your house and stole your laptop computer, what could they be charged with? Well, there's two crimes that merge together, breaking and entering. And if it happens at night in some jurisdictions, it doesn't always have to happen. It's also called burglary, if you take something without permission while you do that. Our son Andrew is practicing criminal law in Florida. Hope that you never get caught breaking into somebody's house in Florida, because in Florida, if you break into somebody's house, automatically, six years in jail. The judge can't mitigate it at all. Six years in jail. So we try to protect the privacy and the integrity of our families in America. But have you been robbed yet by anything I've said? <laughs> Robbery only occurs when the owner is present. Mm. Mm. And the person doing the robbery has the ability or the present intention of actually harming the person to get this. Mm. So I'm going to tell you, I have been robbed. And I will tell you the story very quickly. A number of years ago, when I was working with ASI, the men, this is the Adventist Labor Services and Industries, for those of you who may not know, the, the uh, people in the ASI came up with the idea, why don't we have some wonderful thing for fathers and sons to get together, and we'll go down to Guatemala and help them to school that totally from Guatemala. So we got 16 men and their sons to go on this trip. We're coming from all over America, but we flew into Guatemala City, and as most of the flights are, it came in the evening. So it's like 9 o'clock at night when we're all in there. By the time we get our luggage and clear customs and so on, it's like 11 o'clock at night. What we had done was raise the money for it and get the people there. But Maranatha organization had actually provided the transportation, taken our money and bought the building materials and all of that. So we come in there and look, uh, we're about ready to get out of the airport at 11 o'clock. I thought, I know there's going to be a bus waiting for us because people have met us there. They're going to take us to a church school or something. We're going to roll out our sleeping bags and just sleep at the church overnight. And then we can drive for six hours down to Total Nikon in the daytime so we can see Guatemala. I mean, I'd never been there before, and I was really looking forward to this. But something amazing happened. When we went out, the bus we were getting on was a bus that was pink, and it had big purple polka dots on it, and then in script writing in white, it said Turista, oh. which in Guatemala and Spanish means rich Americans, please rob us. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. Sometime in the night, this must have been like 1 o'clock in the morning, we're driving down the Pan American Highway, and we 
there was this little smudge pot thing with the flame coming up in the middle of the road, and a policeman stepped out of a little booth and held up his hand, and the bus driver stopped. The policeman came on, shut his light around, and sure enough, a whole bunch of rich Americans. We believe the police were actually involved in this, but about a half an hour later, a great big truck drove right across the highway, made a stop, screeched to a stop. And I was wide awake when all this happened, so I'm the first you know, person story I'm telling you. I don't sleep very well when someone else is driving. Kathy says I sleep better when I'm driving. So I, <laughs> I said to my friends, the other 15 men and their sons, wake up, you guys, we've got problems. And I spoke to the man who was driving, which apparently could only speak Spanish, which I believe is the language of heaven. But anyway, he said, I said to him, do not stop. Hit the ditch. Try to go around. But men were jumping out of this truck with rifles and pistols and so on. And they're coming down. The bus screeched to a stop. And of course, the, the doors of the bus, this old school bus, had bolts down through them so they couldn't swing open. But that's no problem. They knocked out, you know, they've got a rubber grommet around the windows. They knocked one of those out. The guy reached in and took it out, opened the door. Before we knew it, there were like eight guys on the bus with guns. Some guy at the back had a big rifle. So if anybody got smart, the Guatemalan men are a little bit shorter than me. I mean, physically, if we were all without guns, we wouldn't have had a problem. But they're the ones with the guns, you understand. So anyway, they systematically came down the bus and robbed everyone. So they came to me, and Andrew sitting beside me, and I had purchased a cheap watch, a Timex watch from Walmart, because I knew that when I got down, I was going to be mixing more, and I didn't want to get concrete on my good watch. I paid nine dollars for this at Walmart, but it was brand new. Like, oh, by the way, my good watch is twenty-four ninety-five. <laughs> but anyway, this guy came to me, and he reached out and started pulling on my watch, which means I'm taking your watch. And I had Spanish in high school, but I forgot every word I ever learned. <laughs> so I said, "Chico." You, you don't want this thing. He had just taken a Rolex off of somebody up front, a real genuine one. So he was pulling on my watch, and I said, Cheapo. And I acted like I wasn't going to give it to him. Andrew sitting beside our son, and this guy pulled out an old 38 revolver. It's not one of these new automatic 9 millimeters you see all the time. It's a revolver. You can see the bullets in the middle. He caught the hammer back and stuck it right on my head. And of course, he's nervous as all get out. His gun is bumping against me on the head. And he says, Daddy, give it to him. I did. We were robbed. Do you understand? I won't tell you the rest of the story. We all survived. This is an amazing story. But do you understand how serious robbery is? How does God get by with saying if we fail to return our tithe to this robbery? I thought he had to be present. Doesn't the owner have to be present? Hebrews tells us, this is interesting, all things are naked and open for him before whom we must give an account. David says, if I make my bed down at the bottom of the sea or on the top of the mountain, God is there. Do you understand? He has plans for this, you understand. And that's the reason why it's so serious. Okay, we're going to go along quickly. The evasion of the positive commands of God concerning tithes and offerings, read the books of heaven as robbery for him. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but there's just two contrasts here. He who embezzles his Lord's goods not only loses the talent lent him of God, but loses eternal life. Of him it is said, cast to the unprofitable servant of the outer darkness. The faithful servant, on the other hand, who invests his money in the cause of God to save souls and employs his means to the glory of God will receive the commendation of the master. Well done, of the faithful servant. Those are the words we want to hear. Okay, we're going to go on here. I'll just mention this one thing before I show you this. I have slipped and said you guys a couple of times, even though I really meant y'all. You understand what I'm talking about? <laughs> Just two weeks ago, I was speaking with David Asher's group out in Jasper, Oregon, the Arise, when the trained Bible workers, and it's okay to say you guys out there, because that's where I was raised out in London, California, Oregon. But anyway, when I first went to Southern Evans University, or Southern Missionary College then, I uh, had never in my life ever had grits. <laughs> I love grits now, but I'd never had grits before. And I had been raised by my mother to say, if someone offers you something, if you may not like it, but you might like it, and even if you don't like it, you can mix it with something else, just so you don't get a small amount to be courteous. 
So the first time I went through the line at Sutton, there's these beautiful young women back there serving the food up, and one of them said to me, would you like some grits? <laughs> now I had oatmeal, cornmeal, all those kind of, Roman meal, all those kind of things, all kinds of dry cereal, but I've never had grits before. So I remember when Mother told me, I said, well, sure, I'll try one. <laughs> <laughs> She said, I don't think I'd give you just one if I gave you a small serving, but that'd be okay. So, you have to learn a new language here. It's a better language. So, when I first started hearing doll, I thought that was a real nice term. Then I thought about what Malachi in the third chapter, bring doll the ties to the storehouse. And I thought, maybe Malachi was from Alabama or Tennessee. <laughs> Bring you all the ties to the storehouse. <laughs> the King James Version says it more correctly. Bring all the ties to the storehouse. Not y'all bring the ties, but bring all the ties. In other words, don't keep part of that. Does that make sense? Okay. There's another one interesting. We talked about blessing and curses earlier. Revival and Reformation. Malachi 3 says, return to me and I'll return to you. This is a great one in the Bible. We'll talk just briefly about how much time, and this will finish us up today. Churches that are most liberal and systematic and supporting the cause of God are the most prosperous spiritually. You have generous people here, because God's going to bless your church. There's no question about that. So we're going to look at this one, practical benevolence. We'll give spiritual life to thousands of nominal professors of the truth. What are nominal professors of the truth? What does nominal mean? About your name. Chaos or nobre. You know, nominal. That's your name. What is your name? Well, it means that you're a name in Christian, you're, you're a Christian in name only. Well, they would say if, if you were arrested for being a Christian, they wouldn't be enough evidence to convict you. That's what a nominal Christian is, by name only. But practical benevolence will transform them from selfish, covetous worshippers of men, which we learned last night is money, wealth, and riches, to earnest, faithful co workers with Christ in the salvation of souls. Very, very important. So, what is an honest power? There's three elements in English. They all begin with the letter P. The portion, which is one-tenth. The place you return it is the storehouse. Oh, by the way, let's just stop for a second here. Where is the storehouse? Using the biblical model, the storehouse is the place from which the pastors are paid. So where is the storehouse? The conference office. For the convenience of the members and for part of our worship experience, we bring our tithes and offerings here. I don't know who the treasurer of the church is here, but I can guarantee you that the treasurer sends all the tithes straight away to the conference, and the pastors in the conference receive their money from the conference. Is this true in Carolina? Yes. I don't believe it is. Let me just tell you, the pastor doesn't come to the treasurer on Saturday night and say, man, give me some of that tithe that came in today because I've got to make my car payment or my rent's due or whatever. It doesn't happen that way. The tithe goes to the storehouse in which it is distributed. The purpose is, of course, the support of the ministry. Now, I'm going to show you something. I understand the pastor talked about the widow in the first service today. Some of you probably weren't there, so let me give you a little bird's eye view of this. Very interesting. Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. He took the disciples to church to watch the people put in their offerings. And he was so attentive that he knew the lady put in two copper coins. Then he said, this lady gave more than all the others. And then he said something else. She's going to remember down through time. What I want you to know is this. Everybody here that's an adult knows there's problems in the Adventist church. There could even be problems in your church. But does that mean I shouldn't support it with my tithe? No way. Because the tithe is holy and belongs to God. This is important. This lady gave her last two coins to a church that was just about to kill Jesus. Talk about corrupt. And yet he prays for it. Is that incredible or not? I think it is. So somebody, I'm going to read this to you in just a second, but let me give you the illustration of the background for it. Somebody sent me an email with, from a guy who says he's a prophet, an Adventist prophet. And he, they sent me email number 24, vision number 24. And this vision said, if you support the church with all its problems today, and it named a whole bunch of them, God's going to hold you responsible and you will lose your eternal life. So I took that as an occasion to write a letter to every pastor in North America. Fortunately, I had the opportunity to do that and had all their emails. And we sent it out to all the pastors. 
The title of it was The False Prophet of Tithing. Because I found a statement in volume two of the testimonies, page 519. Those self sacrificing by some consecrated ones who render back to God the things that are His, as He requires of them, will be rewarded according to their works, even though the means thus consecrated be misapplied so that it does not accomplish the object which the donor had in view, the glory of God and the salvation of souls. Those who made the sacrifice in sincerity of soul with an eye of the glory of God will what? Not, not lose their reward. I like that. So, here's the review. We're done. The three greatest hindrances to financial faithfulness, debt bondage, treasure sorted on this earth, trusting more in our treasures than God, and financial unfaithfulness to God. You want to be ready when Jesus comes back? You want to be ready to go through that difficult time when God's going to feed us with the angels and the ravens? You understand this is how to get ready. To the faithful servants, he says, well done, good faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. I will close with this little sentence. The words, well done, are only spoken to those who manage their money Christianly. I want to hear those words when Jesus comes, don't you? Well done. Well, this afternoon we're going to talk about all those different topics that I mentioned to you. I hope you can come back. But before we do that, I want to ask you just a simple question. Would you like to raise your hand to ask God to give you faith to strengthen your core to Him? Just that simple question. Okay? God sees it. Because we invited Him here today. So I want to thank you for that. I'm not real sure who has the benediction. Do I have it or does someone else have it? Should I have the benediction? Okay. Uh, I just noticed in the bulletin there is a benediction, and I wasn't sure if I was going to do it or not. Can we pray together? Let's bow our hands. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings to each of us. We thank you for telling us so insightfully about what it's going to be like at the end. We're looking forward to that time when we can trust you even more fully than now. We pray that you'll strengthen our cords and trust in you, so that we'll be able to tell the devil that uh, we're trusting in you and not going with him. We pray that you bless each family and each person that is here. May our insights be uh, opened up into your word more carefully. And we have the, the faith to follow and the determination to be a part of those who hear the words well done when you come back. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.